Every week, Hillsdale College President Larry P. R. joins Hugh Hewitt to discuss great books, great men, and great ideas. This is the Hillsdale Dialogues, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. Also at the Hillsdale College Podcast Network, check out the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, the Larry P. Arn Show, and more, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. You're listening to the Hillsdale Dialogue. That music tells you it's the last radio hour of the week. And as I promised you last week, the debates behind us, we don't know. We taped this before the debate. I don't know if I got booed off the stage or if we had a great debate. I have no idea. Dr. Arn, you got a prediction on how I did before we did it? Yeah, you probably weren't very good. That's what I figured you'd say. You know, in the old Hillsdale Dialogues, we wrapped one up and we edited it. We got rid of all the nasty things you said about me. It was only about 28 minutes out of 38 minutes after I was done with that. Dr. Larry Arn is the president of Hillsdale College. All things Hillsdale are found at hillsdale.edu. All of our previous Hillsdale Dialogues, all 509 of them, are collected at hughforhillsdale.com. Next week, we return to World War I and the week before the World War began. But this week, I asked Dr. Arn because... He knows a lot about this, and not many people do. How did the Middle East come to be the Middle East? Now, I read the book A Peace to End All Peace by David Frompkin. I read a couple of stories that reminded me of everything that Churchill did. But if you're going to understand the Israel-Hamas war and the larger context of that war, the war that Israel is waging on its northern border with Hezbollah, with Syria, and probably with Iran, you got to know how it got started. And Dr. Arm began to get into this last week, and I wanted to pick up on that. The the king of Jordan was not very happy with the idea of the Mufti of Jerusalem having his own country. So he kind of threw in with the Jews. But on the other hand, there was a Jordanian army uh, advancing on Tel Aviv. Wasn't there in 1948, Dr. Arn? Were they just not moving quickly? Yeah. And there was up in the north, especially, it was better. They There was a lot of cooperation with some of the Arabs who lived up that way and and over the way. And, you know, if you uh, I'm going to so I have to stop and pay you a compliment. I bet I, I actually bet this is a good compliment to pay because I can retract it after I watch the debate. I bet you did a good job. And I'll tell you why you're on the right side of all this. The debates are putrid. And the reason is the press controls them and they are tests of how you're going to be able to deal with us. Whereas what we really need to see is the candidates talking and arguing with each other because they're going to have to sit in rooms and make decisions as our representatives. And so how would you make those decisions is a great question. And not how do you respond to peppering from us. And so that, you know, it should be as much as possible like the Lincoln-Douglas debate, which I know I've talked to you about it for hours on the radio, you admire. So good for you giving them a chance to talk. And uh, those chances, in my opinion, should be vastly accelerated and exact and amplified. Well, uh, I'm one of back. three moderators, yeah. but I, I do control my own questions, and we'll see how it turned out. And then next week we can talk about, or two weeks from now, we can talk about whether or not it fell flat. And hopefully no one has even know who the moderators are. Isn't that really the point of moderators is not to be noticed? Yeah, and do you know who the moderators were of the Lincoln-Douglas debates? There were none. Well, there was someone who introduced them, and then they got off of the stage, I believe. That's right. Nobody did, right? Right. And they were, you know, they were, if you, if you, like, one of the reasons they're so rude to each other is that it's all controlled from outside, and they have to contend, whereas... The way it went with Lincoln and Douglas was they would sort of reason together out loud in front of the people about, are we going to take a break for dinner? Stuff like that. Uh, So, yeah, uh, I hope you're able to fix this. Thank you for that compliment. I want to go back to how much time you spent in Israel and why we're talking about Israel in the context of talking about Churchill. And this means you got to go back to your time with Martin Gilbert and you got to go back to Churchill 
after the war. And we're going to go back to World War I next week. But but set this all up for us, because people might not know, new listeners, while you were away, we picked up two new affiliates in, in the Florida Keys and one at Cape May, New Jersey. They have no idea who you are or Dr. Gilbert is. And I'll educate them in time, but tell them about Martin Gilbert a little bit. Well, he's the greatest historian of the 20th century. Uh, he wrote 85 big, fat books of history. They're all closely following the documents, almost all in chronological order. And he was a very great man who set very high standards, and I was privileged to work for him and uh, met my wife working in his house, very important thing to me and uh, somewhat important to her. And uh, I ended up being a colleague of his for the rest of his life, and I ended up completing the final document volumes of the Churchill biography. Great privilege to know him. He was a great historian, including of uh, Israel. Uh, he was uh, he wrote books on the founding of Israel, on the Holocaust. On he, he wrote a great thing. He, I encourage people to look at. He loved to write historical atlases, maps illustrating the layout of the land and the movement of armies and peoples uh, in maps with lots of captions and descriptions and boxes saying when this happened. So you can see a picture of it. And he wrote those, drew those maps himself. If you understand the movements of peoples that produced the nations in the Middle East, his atlas of Middle East history is really great. There are two or three of them, actually. Uh, and they're not too expensive. So, you know, it's, 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 it, the details are rich and interesting, but the, the, the basic story is pretty simple. The Ottoman Empire had control of the, what we call the Middle East today from the early 16th, 16th century until the end of the First World War when it made a fateful, fateful decision and joined the Germans and, and lost its empire. It was revived under Ataturk Mustafa Kemal uh, later after the war and wasn't an empire anymore. It was modern Turkey. As the war went on, separately, Arabs and Jews went to the British and said, we'll fight for you if you will give us states after it's over, a homeland. And the Jews were eventually led by some famous Jews, some people who became founders of modern Israel, Yigal Yadin, the great archaeologist, David Ben-Gurion, the first president of Israel, people like that. And they proved to be great statesmen and great soldiers, in the case of Yadin, also great scholars. And then the Arabs fought under Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, a friend of Winston Churchill's, his partner, his number two, in running the colonial office after the First World War. The League of Nations, which didn't last very long, uh, gave Britain and France especially a mandate over parts of the Middle East to make a transition toward their independence. And that's what Britain accepted. Churchill didn't want any more than that. He didn't want any of those lands. The Balfour Declaration made in the middle of the First World War by Arthur Balfour, a friend of Churchill's that we've talked about on this show, with Churchill's help and assistance, they promised a Jewish national home in Palestine. And so then after the war, you know, the First World War is, is, ends in 1918, and Hitler comes to power in January of 1933. And in between, there was a lot of figuring about what exactly are we going to do all? What are these states going to look like? And there were many different partition plans uh, because one of the hopes, Churchill's hope, which he held onto for a long time was there would be a state that would include Arabs and Jews and they would get along and protect each other's rights. That didn't prove possible. So they're going to divide it. Right. And there were three major, if memory serves, partition plans. And the one that was ad eventually adopted for Israel is the smallest of the three. And it is objectively tiny. Uh, it's a little bitty country. Uh, you can ride a bicycle the length of it in a day. You can, 
if you're a marathon runner, you could probably run the width of it in many places in a day. A couple of times. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, that's right. Yeah, and so it's uh, and and the point to remember is if Iraq is legitimate, it's just one example. There are several. Then Israel is legit, legitimate because they arose from the same facts. We're going to come uh, right back to that because that is the key fact, though. That is the key fact. If you accept the existence of the modern Arab states, you have to accept the existence of Israel. I'll be right back. Dr. Larry on this Hillsdale Dialogue on the founding of the modern Middle East continues right after this. Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I've got a challenge for you today. Become a better educated American citizen. And to help you do just that, we at Hillsdale College have our free online courses available for all who wish to learn. Our challenge? Take just one of our courses. There are so many to choose from, you can discover the beauty of the Bible in the Genesis story. Study the writings of C.S. Lewis or explore the true meaning of America in Constitution 101. We have dozens more to choose from, and all these self-paced free courses feature Hillsdale faculty and scholars, many you've heard on this podcast. So visit hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, and pick one of the more than 30 free Hillsdale courses. I hope you'll accept my challenge. Pick whichever course you like and become a more educated citizen today. Go to hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, Dr. Larry Arn is president of Hillsdale College. All things Hillsdale, applications, donor links, and primus are collected at hillsdale.edu. All of our dialogues are collected at hughforhillsdale.com. Dr. Arn, in the book, A Peace to End All Peace, it describes the map drawing, the line drawing, in which Churchill is intimately involved. And you were making the point when we went to break that if you accept that Iraq is a state and that Syria is a state and that Lebanon is a state, you have to accept Israel as a state, even though the U.N. recognized it in 1948, because it's all the same map. How did Churchill end up in the middle of that? Well, he was pretty good at that. Churchill was an important man for almost, you know, for all of his life, uh, you know, from his adulthood on. And so he was and, you know, the particular causes of him getting, you know, he he was ejected and uh, out of the government because of the Dardanelles, which had to do with Turkey. You know, it's it's fun to study history because come to find out everything's connected. Yeah. And and, and you know, uh Here's a little aside that's interesting. I don't want to confuse people, though. I want to emphasize the simple story. The simple story is the immediate cause of the modern state of Israel is a set of facts that also created several Arab countries and stands on the same footing as those countries. And that that if you can get anything in your mind, get that in your mind. Now, here's some funny stuff, though. There's this, we're going to talk about it, but uh, the German battle cruiser that was loose in the Mediterranean at the out, out, out break of the First World War was eventually given to the Turks. And that was sort of one of the reasons Turkey went with Germany. Another reason was Churchill thought they were about to do that. And there were two ships, warships being built for Turkey in British shipyards and Churchill first ordered the Admiralty seize them. And, you know, that ticked them off, but uh, yeah, he made a judgment, bad. right? I think they're going to go with the Germans. We're not going to let them have these ships. So the Germans gave them a ship. Now they gave them a ship that they couldn't get back home anymore because the British Navy was in the way, get out of the Mediterranean. So that's all fun. This ship, the Gobin, became the flagship of the Turkish Navy until 1953, roughly. And its last great service was to carry the founder of modern Turkey, Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal, in state to his burial. <laughs> so, I did not funny. know that. The Gobin? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, we're talking <laughs> about the Gobin fun. next week. It's an, it's an amazing story yeah. at the beginning of the war and how Churchill, I'm, a, a little teaser. 
The British government won't fire on the Gobin because it is a country built on honor and war hadn't been declared. How's that work in the modern age, Dr. Arne? Yeah, well, it, it is ultimately the thing that will work. Because you can't, I mean, you can't raise up young men and induce them by ideology and payment to slaughter babies. Uh, you can't do that. And make a video of, of it being done. You can't do that. Right. And they're just there are a few things that you just can't do. And Britain has never done those things. And we have never done those things. And Israel has never done those things. So it, if you're going to pick sides, that's the side to be on. It's all of a uh, piece. It's all of if, if you can't get to this is absolutely good. You can't get to what Dr. Arn just said. It's all a continuum or a building block of logic. Am I right? Am I, is that correct? That's right. It's you know it's you know uh, nations. Uh, Margaret Thatcher said famously, "They don't uh, nations don't have friends; they have allies." True, but you do have to sort of make your diplomacy somehow with some continuity in it. And the way to go about it, in my opinion is to pick the countries that have stability and representative government. Because in those governments, there is a principle that means that force is not everything, right? I mean, I you know, I fear about the American Republic very much these days and think that the government is getting out of hand and it's hard for us to control it anymore. Its uh, participation in elections is dangerous, the partisanship of law enforcement at the national level in elections is dangerous. I think all that. But the reason is for that, the reason one thinks that's so serious is because there are principles to justify it now that are different from the principles that the country was founded under. In Israel, in Israel Israeli politics is a god-awful mess. You know, they've never, never had a majority government, not once, in Israel. And, and it's always a coalition. Churchill said of, he, he liked Israel a lot and called himself a Zionist from about 1906 till he died. But he said once, whenever there are three Jews, there are two prime ministers and one leader of the opposition. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I had dinner with a bunch of guys from Tikva, which is a Jewish group in New York that we have some cooperation with. And uh, I like them a lot. And we sat down to dinner. We were in a, you know, condemned. Hold world, that but- story till after the break. I want to hear the whole story complete, and people will have to listen through the break to come back and hear about Dr. Arn and Tikva. Don't go anywhere, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. This is the Hillsdale Dialogue. All things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, is my guest. As this the last radio hour of the week continues on this Veterans Day, uh, Dr. Arn, um, you were talking about meeting with a Jewish group, Tikva, in New York. Pick up on that story, please. It, it's actually a story about what Jews are like. You know, I'm I, I'm fond of Israel and fond of many Jews, and both my, most of my main teachers are life in life are Jews. And here am I, a Christian, uh, have been all my life more lately. I mean, consistently anyway. Well, we sat down to dinner and uh, we were in a Jewish restaurant, a kosher restaurant, good restaurant in New York. And everybody started talking all at once. (laughs) That's what they're like. And, uh, and, you know, they're, and Israel is like that too. It's a big mess, right? And, and uh, it somehow has preserved because, you know, Israel was founded in war. They had a U.N. resolution. The Russians voted for it. The Soviets voted for it. We voted for it in 1947. Uh, it passed 33 to 13. I looked it up in Martin Gilbert this morning. The British abstained. <laughs> That's, uh, and a bunch of Arab countries voted against it. That was the 13. All of them were in that. Uh, I think Jordan might have. Uh, don't quote me on that. Anyway. Uh, it's founded in war, 
you know, because they were immediately under attack from many sides. And before the day of independence, they had not really ever had a government. And they'd been sort of organizing, you know, informally and formally to get ready. And they managed to sustain themselves through that war and many wars since. And this this thing that's happened in early October is, you know, one in a long line. And uh, that's, you know, they're, they're used to that. And one of the points is they're going to try, you know, to, there's a lot of voices to call for the destruction of Hamas. That's probably not possible. In other words, they can hope probably to reduce it and they can hope to discipline it. And maybe they can even get it out of Gaza, which would be a good thing. But, you know, all of that traces back to bigger powers, to Iran and its ally, China. And so, you know, and, you know, if you want to, if you want to, I, I think you can only worry about immediate things right now. First of all, they I can hope to displace it. it. I think they want to displace it. Uh, but that there that you. ideology cannot be actually eradicated. It's too deep in the Islamist world particularly fanatically in the Shia world, but also in the Sunni Muslim world. Same thing that hit us on 9-11. Dr. Arn, um, I had occasion when you were in India to revisit what we talked about in Churchill a few weeks ago. Great Britain was a mess right before World War I. They were on the verge of a civil war over Ireland. And Churchill remarked in the first volume to which we return next week, our enemies misunderstood that at a moment's notice, if a threat was perceived, to the United Kingdom, we would turn as one and fall into line. That's pretty much a direct quote. I'll never forget that. That has happened to Israel. I mean, there are some people who hate Netanyahu who are in the cabinet with him now. I mean, absolutely despise him. They are not, they are not divided right now. There are are some journalists who are covering it like they are divided. They are not divided right now. They are 100% in favor of destroying Hamas. And I, I wonder if people underestimate the resilience of representative government when it comes to threats to the existence of the representative government. Do you think so? Oh, yeah. I think there's a pattern, uh, you know, it's especially visible in the modern world, uh, which where the conditions are that there are whole nations devoted to peace and yet capable of intense war, maybe the most capable of such war. Uh, and, there's a pattern that arises like uh, in 1939 you know, when Hitler launched the second world war by invading Poland, you know, he'd already invaded several countries, but Poland was where the line was drawn. He was ready. He'd been getting ready for a decade. He knew how many troops he had. They were drilled. They were, the plan was made, you know, they conquered France in six weeks. The free countries were not ready. And so it was ambiguous how ready could they get. And, you know, come to find out they got really ready, much bigger, much bigger than Germany by the time it was done. And, and you know, that, that don't think, by the way, that free countries are in all cases capable of more power than tyrannies. The, probably the most powerful country at the end of the Second World War was Soviet Russia. And that's a slave society. So there's no theory or principle that decides in advance how things are going to break out. But there is a tendency that the free countries are stronger than they seem. Uh, And this raises the question about Churchill and World War II, which is not on my list of questions for you, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, There's much justified worry about the death of innocence in Gaza. Because innocent people, and there are innocent people, million of them in Gaza, they don't like Hamas, they'd like to kill Hamas, but they're under the rule of Hamas. Did Churchill spend much time agonizing over the innocent Germans, like Bonhoeffer's in Germany, he's in jail. There are very good Germans who are held captive by the Nazis, but could Churchill spend time, did FDR spend time worrying about them when they waged war? Of course, and... uh... Churchill was, you know, and and uh, there's always something new, right? Uh, the the uh, firebombing 
was, you know, the, the nuclear bomb was a big new thing that right at the end of the Second World War had a big impact. But before that, there was firebombing. And, and uh, I once interviewed Curtis LeMay, the bomber LeMay, the great, I mean, he was a very great Bombs great away LeMay, you time. bet. And he was, and uh, I, I, I said to him, what do you think about the nuclear bomb? You know, because he watched it burst. And he said, well, it was not really a difference in kind, only of degree. And I said, explain that. And he said, well, we learned that by bombing in a certain pattern with a certain kind of bomb and estimating the wind right, we could set a fire that would melt steel. And he said, so that's, and now, that, that meant, you know, if you look at a photograph of Tokyo in 1945, you're looking at a rubble, right? Now, Churchill saw film of the bombing of Dresden, and he was repelled by that. And he said, are we beasts? And they curtailed that afterwards, right? The occasion for the bombing of Dresden was they were trying, that was a railway hookup uh, hub for, for German troops resupplying the forces against Stalin. And so they were doing it to help the Soviet war effort, which was perfectly legitimate. They were allies. But, you know, there was a reason, a military reason, to bomb all of that and disrupt that traffic. But still, uh, civilized people and just people are rebelled by things like that. Well, they have to have the capacity. I did not know that. Are we beasts? If your government is incapable yeah. of asking that, doesn't necessarily tell you how they're going to ask. But if they're not asking that, it's not a civilized government. Hamas is not a civilized organization. It's a terrorist organization. They are beasts. The people that crossed the border on 10-7 were just monsters. So they're not civilized. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it. well, let's put it this way. Like, you know, our government's a mess and... Israel's government a mess, and one of the ways that you estimate how bad a mess is, what is its final purpose? Is it, you know, because, you know, the final purposes of America are stated in the Declaration of Independence and, the you know, everybody's rights. We can poor, men, woman, black and white, everybody. That's the purpose. Never perfectly achieved that, but if it remains the purpose, it sets a limit on how bad it can get. You know, there's a question in America, is that still our purpose? If you just look at the ideology of the woke movement, it's not like that anymore, right? That's, we're going to assign weight and priority by color as a matter of policy. And, you know, that's a different aim and a different kind of government is implied by that more than implied is stated by that. So the point is, you, you want to be on the side. I, Churchill loved to make the distinction. There are countries where people own governments and there are countries where governments own peoples. We want to be on the side of the former. Absolutely. And we want to be one of the former. Well, that's what's wrong with the Hamas regime in Gaza. It is not a system of consent of the governed. It's a bunch of people who take your kids and train them to go do horrific things. And then they're sending apologetic videos to their mothers. And I and And, I uh, I I believe in my heart that that doesn't have to be that way. It's just the ideology and the indoctrination. It does not have to be that way. But changing that is Israel's great task. We come back, we're going to talk very briefly about Winston Churchill in 1948, Winston Churchill in 1956. He wasn't there either at the founding of the state of Israel. He was out of power. And he wasn't there when Israel invaded with Britain and France in the Suez crisis. Churchill had left. So it worked pretty well in between when he was back in power. We'll talk to Dr. Arn about that. Stay tuned to the Hillsdale Dialogue. Hello, this is Kyle Mernon, Director of Online Learning here at Hillsdale College. And I'm excited to announce that we've brought Hillsdale's popular free online courses to the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. And our next course is The Real American Founding, which is taught by Hillsdale professors David Azrad and Thomas West. After completing this course, you'll understand the political theory of the American founding, and you'll see how and why we've departed so far from the American founding today. This Hillsdale College online course podcast is hosted by me, 
and my colleague Juan Davalos, and it looks to expand Hillsdale's mission to provide all who wish to learn the education necessary to preserve the civil and religious liberties of America. And we want you to be a part of it at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Subscribe now to the Hillsdale College Online Courses podcast to hear new episodes every week with additional commentary and insights from our team. Go to podcast.hillsdale.edu to learn more. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu. Thanks for listening. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Dr. Arne, in 1945, Winston Churchill was turned out of office, and the Brits simply messed up the establishment of the Middle Eastern countries and the mandate. And then... After he had been returned to office and left power, Anthony Eden messed up the Middle East again by trying to seize the Suez Canal and reimpose British rule. Did, was Churchill the, the flywheel on which everything spun coherently? And when they took him out of the equation, it just went off the tra- off the tracks? Well, that was, you know, it's a complicated story. Uh, Churchill retired in 1955 and the Suez cr- crisis was in 1956. And Eden took over, and he was the consensus choice. And, yeah, they did that thing. And, you know, in the narrow way, Israel and and Britain were in the right. You know, Nasser was, a, you know, tied up with the Soviet Union. And but they, they, they should have the checked with Ike government. first, because he was the one that well, made him stop. Right. Yeah, Churchill said, and, you know, Churchill's on the sideline, right, but he's— you know, he's still healthy. His health really deteriorated about five years later. But uh, and he died in 1965. Harold Macmillan is coming to see him all the time and, you know, would eventually be Eden's successor. And Macmillan was very skeptical about this thing. And the one thing Churchill said, uh, you know, n- nothing in public negative at all. But it's preserved that he said to more than one person, I wouldn't have done it without the Americans. Uh, and that was, you know, it might have been a mistake by us, but I don't know enough to know that because, you know, provoking a, you know, a confrontation with the Soviet Union right then might not have been the right thing. But that, you know, that's and see, that's another thing We're we you know, I, I noticed in India and I noticed in Israel that there's something about America that's different. And that is. We think we're the greatest. We think we're the most important, right? We don't, we, we and, and Britain thought that for a very long time. Turned out by 1956, it was not true anymore. They had to adjust to that. Well, we may have to adjust too, because, you know, I pray not. And above all, you can't really do anything except play your part, right? What, what, what are the resources you got and how do you deploy them honorably and for your safety first, but always toward the right. And every nation in the world that's trying to be decent has to answer that question, and we have to answer it, and Israel has to answer it. And, and you know, the, the kicker in the modern world is that these radical nations, China, uh, Iran, prime examples... I don't know about modern Russia exactly. It's more complicated. But those are fueled by toxic Western ideologies. Islam has been converted into a kind of utopianism. And, you know, I I like to think, and I guess I do think, that it's not inherently that. And it, there are strong voices, and always have been, that say that it's a religion of peace, and i we pray that it is so, but not as it's practiced in the leadership of Iran. And, you know, I have an Iranian friend, a Californian, and uh, he tells me that uh, people in Iran think this government is crazy. Yep. But what can they do about it? You know, they've and, tried and to so, rise up a couple of times. Unfortunately, they did so under President Obama and they did so under President Biden, who stood by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, so. We, you know, we can't fix all the problems in the world, but in conducting our own policy, we should always have an eye. And, you know, every, by the way, potential rule has to have some flexibility in it. You know, we made an alliance with the Soviet Union in the Second World War. It saved a lot of lives, cost a lot of Russian lives. 
And and we had to do that, right? And that's, I'm glad we did. But then, you know, you got the Cold War after that. I'm glad that did not issue in the World War III. And I hope nothing does today. But in, as a rule, you should look to the countries where the people own the government. And India is such a country. And Italy, sorry, Italy is such a country, probably unless, yeah, it is. Uh, Israel, I meant to say, is such a country. And so you should look with a kindly eye toward them. And and step up when they ask for our help. That's what's happening in Israel. Dr. Ron and I will return next week to World War I as we sort of dance on the edge of cataclysm. And that's when you had two carrier groups off the coast of Israel and Hezbollah with 150,000 missiles. We're taping this early. Who knows what will happen by the time it airs on Veterans Day. But I will tell you this, uh, the week that led up to World War I is very much worth your, your deep study. And that's where we're going back to next week. Chapter 10 in the first volume of Winston Churchill's The World Crisis is about the mobilization of the Navy and when people act in the best interest of their country, even when their uh, nominal leaders aren't saying go. We'll talk about that next week. Dr. Larry Arn, all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. All of our previous segments on the First World War are collected at you for hillsdale.com. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Harley. Thank all of you for listening. I'll talk to you Monday on the next Do It Show. Thanks for listening to the Hillsdale Dialogues, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. For more information about Hillsdale College, head to hillsdale.edu.